It's good to be together once again in the house of the Lord, to gather once more with the people of God and worship Him. And uh, before we do so, before we begin our worship service, there's one announcement that I neglected to say this morning. It's that the deacons will be collecting non-perishable food next Sunday, November 22, for Thanksgiving. And that food will go to Restoration Ministries, and bags of food can be left in the narthex. So let's remember that for next week. And as we begin our worship service, as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth, let's join together in a prayer of invocation. Pray with me. Lord, as this day draws to a close, with the sun setting and the darkness returning, we thank you that we can close it as we began it, by worshiping you. And so as we hear from you this evening, and as we respond in praise and thanksgiving, we pray that you would bless our worship. May it be pleasing to you, glorifying to you, and may it be edifying to us. Lord, we pray that you would build us up through our worship this evening and equip us to continue to live for you in this coming week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, please stand if you're able. As we hear our call to worship this evening, which comes to us from Psalm 34. It says this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And let's exalt the name of our God together in song, singing number 317 in our Blue Psalter hymnal. Come thou almighty king, number 317. Congregation, this God greets us from Scripture with these words from 2 Corinthians. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have been greeted by God as his people, those to whom he has called himself, and as God's people, we are united together. We're united in Christ. We share the same Lord, the same baptism, the same faith. So let's confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find that on page 3 in the Blue Psalter hymnals. And we'll say the Creed with one voice, answering together the question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Scripture reading for this evening will be from Genesis 26, as we continue working through the book of Genesis in the evening together. It can be found on page 38 in your pew Bibles. Genesis 26. Now there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, She is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, Because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, Anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold, because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, 
saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzaf, his personal advisor, and Pichol, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me, since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, There ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but always treated you well and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they left him in peace. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, we found water. He called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and also Basamoth, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Thus far, the reading of God's word. May he continue to bless it to us. Now at this time, let's join. Our song of preparation this evening is number 205 in the Psalter hymnal. The tender love a father has, number 205, and we'll stand and sing that now. Be seated. 
People of God, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll read verses 25 through 34 of Matthew chapter 6, and we'll also read from our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 9. That's found on page 16 in your blue Psalter hymnals. In Matthew 6, Jesus talks about the care God has for his people, and that care, that idea is picked up in Lord's Day 9. That Lord's Day goes through, is part of the section of the Catechism that goes through the different phrases of the Apostles' Creed, which we recited earlier in the service. And this one in particular looks at that very first phrase, looking at what we believe about our God. So we'll read from Matthew 6 starting at verse 25 first. This is the word of our God. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that, even, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of our God. May he bless it to us this evening. And turning now to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 9, I will read the question and let's all join together on the answer. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. And he will turn to my good, whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. People of God, Would you consider yourself to be a worrier? Someone who gets anxious on a day-to-day basis? I think we've all probably got a little bit of a worrier inside of us. We look ahead to the future, we see that it's uncertain, that makes us uncomfortable, and so we worry about it. And we saw that in Genesis 26, didn't we? Isaac was worried about the future, and so he was worried about it. He didn't know how things were going to turn out. And we have those same thoughts. We worry about if we'll keep our job. We worry if we'll be able to pay next month's rent, if we'll get a bad diagnosis at our next checkup, if our kids will grow up right. And I could go on and on with examples about things we might worry about, but I don't think our imaginations need that much help. I think it's very easy that we all, to some degree, are prone to worry. Yet as children of God, Beloved of the Father, we don't need to worry. 
Whatever problems we might face, whatever needs might arise, we can trust in the Lord. And Jesus makes that abundantly clear in tonight's passage, and our catechism picks up on that too. In spite of the future worries that flood our minds, each and every one of us should be able to boldly confess that God, my Father, is able and willing to take care of me. That's our life-transforming reality this evening, that God, my Father, is able and willing to take care of me. And this should really encourage each of us to stop worrying, to rest in Him, and to live for Him. So let's break that down a little bit. First of all, we see that God, my Father, is able to take care of me. He is able to do it. And here we're talking about ability, if God is really capable of taking care of us. And absolutely He is. He is absolutely able to take care of us. And that's what we're really confessing when we say this part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Right? Not God the Father part mighty or kind of mighty. No, he, that He's got some power that He might be able to maybe do it, but no. This is God the Father Almighty. He's got all power. He's omnipotent. There's nothing which He is unable to do. And we see that when we look at creation. God is the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and earth. That's what we confess. And in that first part of the answer of Lord's Day 9, we said the same thing, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them. God created all things out of nothing. There was nothing, and then God spoke. Genesis 1. We have that amazing account of creation where God made everything just by speaking. God said, let there be light. There was light. God said, let dry land appear. There it was. God said, let there be lights in the heavens and Band, sun, moon, and stars. God created all things out of nothing. And everything we see with our senses, everything that you see around you, that, that you hear, that you touch, taste, smell, everything that you can experience with your senses, God made it. Even the very fact that you can sense those things because you have a body, God created that. God created all things from the largest stars and planets down to the very smallest particles and everything in between. That's some pretty tremendous ability, isn't it? And if he's got that kind of ability, there's really nothing that God can't do. In fact, Genesis 18, God says that very same thing to Abraham. God has promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a son, and even though it looks impossible, God asks this rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for God? And the answer really is, of course not. Right? Nothing is too hard from God. God has the ability to make things out of nothing. He has the ability to make life in that dead womb of Sarah. He has the ability to take care of his people. He absolutely has that ability. We see that in creation. And we also see it in his providence. Continuing on in Lord's Day 9, it says of God that he still upholds and rules by his eternal counsel and providence. God upholds all things. Nothing happens apart from his watchful care. He's sustaining everything. He's watching over it all, even down to those very little things that we wouldn't really think would be on God's radar. And that's what Jesus points out in our passage. Right, sitting on that mountain... Teaching his followers, Jesus directs their attention to the sky. He points their eyes up. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. God is watching over his creation in such a way that he feeds each of the birds of the air. And there are a lot of birds in the air, aren't there? Have you ever seen just a huge flock of birds traveling across the sky, thousands of them traveling together, weaving in and out, moving here and there, individuals moving together in tandem? 
It's an amazing sight. And, and God is watching over each and every one of those birds in that flock. And in every flock around the world, he's watching over them all. And he feeds them. He gives a cricket to that one, a worm to that one, a grub to that one. He, whatever it is, God feeds them. He takes care of them. He watches over his creation in such a way that he upholds it. Now, this doesn't mean that God automatically gives food to each of those birds, though, does it? Right? They don't just have seeds deposited in their stomach every morning at 4 a.m. as kind of a reboot. Or they don't just wake up in the morning, stretch out their wings, open up their beaks, and wait for worms to start falling from the sky. No, no birds work to get their food, don't they? If you watch a bird for any amount of time, you'll see that. Me and my family were at a state park over the summer, and there were some swallows who had built some nests on the side of cliffs, and so we just stood there and watched them for a while. And they were busy. They're flying here and there. They're, they're hunting, gathering. They're building their nests. They're bringing food back to their young ones. They were busy working. And yet at the same time, we can say that God was providing for them. He was giving them what they needed. He was making sure that they found those worms they were bringing back. He f made sure that they found that piece of grass that they made, that they put into their nest. Even those instincts that they had to do these things, he had given them. God watches over his creation in that kind of a way. And if he's able to watch over the birds of the air in that, in that kind of a way, how much more is God our Father able to watch over us? That's what Jesus says in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? The implication of Jesus is very clear here. If God is able to watch over these birds and care for them, then he is absolutely able to care for us. There is no doubt about it. And Jesus said this is the same thing about the lilies of the field. Verse 28, he says, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they don't toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Just like the birds, we see this providential care of God over his creation. He's watching over them. And if that's the case, moving again from creation to us, how much more is God able to care for his children? Verse 30, but God, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is here and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You see, God upholds his creation. He feeds the birds. He clothes the plants, and he is able to care for us as well. And therefore, verse 31, we don't need to be anxious. We don't need to be anxious because God, our Father, is able to take care of us. He is able to provide for our needs. All of our needs? Yes, all of our needs. Well, what about yes, all of our needs? Every single need that we have, God is able to care for it. Halfway down the answer of the Lord's Day, we said this, I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. Whatever I need for body and soul, our physical needs and our spiritual needs. God our Father is able to take care of us in both of these ways. And Jesus implied the same thing. At the end of verse 25, he said, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he talks about how God feeds the birds and clothes the lilies. He's, he's able to provide food and clothing and more than that, life and body, what we need for body and soul. So God provides for our physical needs. He provides food, clothing, shelter, the things we need to live. Our Heavenly Father knows that we need them. That's what Jesus says, verse 32. He knows that we need these things and he is able to provide them. But this doesn't mean that we just sit back and expect these things to drop out of the sky for us. Right? Remember the birds. Jesus, or God provides for them, but they still work. And we do too. This isn't an excuse to quit your job and expect the Lord to provide for you somehow. Rather, 
It's an encouragement to trust in the Lord, for he is able to provide for your physical needs. And he's also able to provide for our spiritual needs. Right? We were dead in sin, and God's life-giving grace was applied to our hearts so that we could be made alive and that we could go out and live for him. He provided us with our justification so we're made right with God. He provides us with our sanctification so we can grow in holiness, we can grow in that grace that we need. Every aspect, every other aspect of our salvation too, every other possible thing we can think of, God is able to provide all that we need for body and soul. God is able. And if he wasn't able to do this, then worrying would make a lot more sense, wouldn't it? If God was not able to do this, if God were not almighty, then we wouldn't have much hope of being taken care of, and so we'd have to do it ourselves. We'd have to fend for ourselves. But as children of God, we can confidently say that God, my Father, is able to take care of me. He is God Almighty. He has created all things. He upholds all things. And so he is able to take care of me as well. And he's also willing. He is also willing to take care of me. That's our second point this evening. And this is really a critical part of being able to trust in God's provision. Because if God were only able to take care of us, and he wasn't willing then we couldn't really expect any provision, could we? We need God to be both able and willing. Let's think of it this way. Imagine that you're a poor peasant living hundreds of years ago in the middle middle ages, and you live in this little rundown shack with you and your family, and you need food. And you're not really sure where your next meal is going to come from, so you decide to go out and ask for help. Your neighbor down the road, the first house you come to, they're in exactly the same spot as you are. They're poor and hungry too. They'd be willing to give you food. You get along well with them. They're willing to give you food, but they don't have any, so they're not able. But in town, further down that road, in that big castle, you know there's someone there who's able to help you. He's got a bunch of land, a bunch of animals. He hosts feasts regularly for the lords and ladies of the land. He's got food. And so you you go up to that castle door and you knock and you ask for some food. But he slams the door in your face because he's not willing to give you any. And so that's it. Nobody helps you. Your neighbor was willing but not able. And the rich man in town was able but not willing. Because nobody was both, you didn't get any help. Well, Scripture tells us that our God is both able and and willing to help us. He is able to do this because he is Almighty God, and he desires to do this because he is a faithful Father. That's the last line of Lord's Day 9, and and that provides a lot of comfort, doesn't it? It helps us to stop worrying because because, because our God is both able and willing to help us, to provide us with whatever we need for body and soul. And he's willing to provide for us because he is our father. The catechism says that he is God and father for the sake of Christ, his son. Through Christ, we have been adopted into God's family. God is now our father. We are his children. Galatians 4 is very clear on that. And so is our passage. Twice, Jesus says that God is our heavenly father. And because he is our father, he is willing to to take care of us. He's willing to provide. Because that's that's what fathers do. Fathers care for their children, and they delight in providing for their needs. We see that in our own experience, don't we? Think of your own father. He provided for your needs. Fathers watch over you. They, They take care of you. And if you are a father, think of the care that you have for your child, your children. You want what's best for them, and and you delight in providing it for them. I understood that concept in theory, but I understand it so much more now that Hazel and Silas have been born. Fathers care for their children. And when we see that around us with earthly fathers, being a father, it gives us a picture 
of our Heavenly Father. But that's really, it's an imperfect picture that we see, isn't it? Because none of the earthly examples of fatherhood that we see around us are perfect. Dads, you know it. I know that I'm not perfect. All the fathers that we have are imperfect as well, with shortcomings and failings, some more than others. In fact, for some of you, father might be a hard word to hear. You might have had an awful experience of a bad father, unloving, uncaring, perhaps even abusive. When you hear God being your father, maybe you shudder. But this God, our heavenly father, he's better than any earthly father, good or bad. He is the perfect father who delights in caring for his children. And Jesus shows us that delight in our passage. He talks about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and how involved God is in watching over them and in caring for them. He basically said, if if that's the amount of care that God gives to these lowly creatures, how much more will he care for his children whom he loves? How much more will he provide food for us? How much more will he clothe us? How much more will he provide everything that we need for body and soul? If God cares for the birds and the lilies, how much more does he care for you? If God cares that much for the grass that's here today and is gone tomorrow, how much more will he care for his children whom he has predestined for eternal glory? It shows the delight that God has in caring for his children. He's not doing it grudgingly, as if somebody is making him do it. Nobody's twisting God's arm to do this. Right? He's not thinking, okay, fine, I guess I'll take care of you. No, he delights in caring for his children. He delights in caring for us because he is our faithful father. And we can see that when we think about what's involved in his care for us. God's care is so fulsome, isn't it? He watches over our physical needs and he provides for them. He he gives us jobs and income so that we can purchase things like food, house, and transportation. And if we don't have that kind of income, he's given us a church family to help support us, to care for our physical needs in that way. And he watches over our health and our bodies, even down to the very hairs on our head. Lord's Day 1, right? He he watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. God watches over our bodies and he delights to take care of our physical needs. And he delights to take care of our spiritual needs. Think John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It was out of love that God sent Jesus to this earth that he would die on the cross, taking our sins upon himself and giving us his righteousness. It was out of love that he provided for our spiritual needs that way. God desires to care for his children, and he loved us so much that he gave us what we need. So body and soul, that's his care for us. It's all-encompassing. It involves every part of us. And God is both able and willing to help us in these ways. So let's think for a few moments about the implications of this. How this knowledge that God is both able and willing to take care of us should impact our lives. Well, first, it should encourage us to pray. When you pray, do you ever think, what good is this actually doing? Right? Why am I even bothering? In a way, we saw that feeling this morning. But we can continue to pray. Because our God is both able and willing to hear our prayers and to answer, our, to watch over us and to care for our needs no matter what they are. And so we can go with confidence to our Father. We can pray with confidence because we know that He is able to help. He watches over all things. He created all things. Surely He is able to help us no matter what our needs might be. And He desires to help us. He's our Father. He loves us. He wants to hear from us, and so we should be encouraged to pray. Because he is our Father, and he is able and willing to help us, that means that we can go to the Lord with our prayers, and they won't be ignored. 
Remember that example when we were peasants? Right? We said you wouldn't go to your neighbor for, for food because he wasn't able to provide you with any, and you wouldn't go to the castle down the street because he was able but not willing to help you. Right? Our God isn't like either one of those. Our God is able and willing to help us, to care for us, and that should encourage us to go to him, to ask him for things in prayer. 1 John 5 says that this is the confidence that we have toward him, our Father, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can have this confidence when we pray, confidence in the Almighty God who is also our faithful Father. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged as you pray, as you bring your requests before the Lord. He is both able and willing to care for you. So this knowledge encourages us to pray. It also, it encourages us to trust in him. That's what Lord's Day 9 says. I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. We can trust God. And when you think about it, worrying is really an action that comes out of an untrusting heart. We worry because we're not trusting the Lord like we should, because we're not remembering that he is able and willing to care for us. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Trust. Trust in the Lord, for he knows you need these things. And we can trust. We can trust our Heavenly Father, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Those tough times, those trying times when trusting is hardest. When worrying can rise to a crescendo and be all that we think about. Even in those difficult circumstances, we can trust in the Lord. Let's go back to the Lord's day. I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends upon me in this veil of tears. I trust God that he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me we face a lot of adversity in this life. Some of us more than others, but we all face it. A death of someone close to us, a a parent, a child, a, a spouse. Diseases that come upon us and harm us. Businesses that fail, a job that is lost, strained relationships. Adversity can come upon us in so many types of ways. We're, we're in a valley of tears, but even then, We can trust God. You know Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, even though I'm going through this veil of tears, this difficult circumstances, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Even in these difficult circumstances, you can trust in the Lord. He is with you, and he is able and willing to care for you. No matter what you're going through, you can trust in him. You don't need to worry, but you can trust that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, Romans 8, 28. So that also enables us to live for him. Jesus tells his followers not to be anxious because our father knows what we need. And then he says this in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom And his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. When, by the grace of God, we're not consumed with worry, but we're trusting in God's provision for all that we need, for body and soul, we can then live for him. So at the end of the day, when you're feeling worried, when you feel the cares and concerns of this life pile up, remember that God is able and willing to care for you. It's easy to forget, right? In the heat of the moment, it's easy to forget that God is in control, that he's watching over you, that he loves you, and he cares for you. It's easy to forget. So when we're in those situations, when worry starts to creep into our minds, let's remember the words of Jesus. Let's remember the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's remember to say to ourselves that God, my Father, is able and willing to take care of me. By the grace of God, may we remember to pray to our Father 
and trust in him even when the path ahead is uncertain. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you know that we struggle with worrying. We worry about the future. We worry about all sorts of things. And yet we know that you are able and willing to help us and to care for us. So please help us to come to you with our prayers and requests, for you hear them. Help us to trust in you. And Lord, let us never take your care for granted, but let us always praise you for watching over us and feeding us and clothing us and giving us everything we need for body and soul. We thank you most of all for our precious Savior, through whom we have salvation, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Congregation, let's praise God right now for his care for us. Standing to sing number 328 in the Blue Psalter hymnals, My God, how wonderful thou art, number 328. People of God, hear these words from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.